All right, so we're gonna um, start in a bit. I'm just gonna give people the chance to shuffle on in. Make sure that my video is also okay. It's very bright behind me. One moment. Is this any better? Kind of. All right, cool. You just look like an angel, that's all. That's all. I mean, that's just me. Your halo effect, I love it. So we can get started. Um, some people might still be coming in, but I don't want to uh, waste anyone's time because this usually lasts quite a while, hopefully, because you guys have so many questions. Uh, just so everyone knows, we do have Samantha Mundell in the chat. Uh, you heard her a little bit earlier if you were in here uh, before she muted herself. She's in that chat for any questions you might have that I might not catch or that faculty members might not catch. Uh, she is, and she'll introduce herself uh, shortly, but she is the, the head honcho for our admissions process. So she knows the answers to any questions you might have. So if you have any questions, feel free to plop them in that chat. Uh, so I am Samantha Fraley, I go by Jax. J-A-X, uh, because Sam was here first, so I got the nickname. And I'm the person that you guys have been talking to if you had any questions uh, in terms of prospective student things. So anything about admissions, questions about PTCAS, questions about the program. Um, if you've been in any of our other open houses, then you've seen me there. Uh, so that's my position within the program, is just to make sure that you guys know what's going on, uh, what the whole process is of getting into the program and I hope that we can answer some of those questions today as well. So uh, before we get into introductions for everyone else, I would like to share my screen if I do that first one moment. Okay. And here we go. Boop, boop, boop. All right, so we're going to actually start out with our fearless leader, Patrick Pabian. He is going to go ahead uh, and not only kick us off uh, with the faculty introductions, but also do a brief overview of the program and PT history. Uh, just to give you guys sort of a background of why you're all here today. All right, so Dr. Papian. Oh, never mind. One second. Let me make sure that this doesn't automatically go. Uh, you know what? We're just going to, so I don't, oh, no, there it was. Okay. All right. Now we're ready. <laughs> Dr. Fabian, if you're ready. Hey guys, uh, uh, glad everyone's here today. Uh, good, good turnout of folks who are interested here in UCF Physical Therapy. I see some faculty, staff, and students kind of trickling in. Uh, I'm in full on Saturday casual mode. I was just working in the garage uh, for the past couple hours and I was like, oh yeah, we have this going on today. Um, but I want to make sure you guys know, uh, you know, these types of open houses and showcases and types of things are not a, uh, a necessarily a product of COVID. We always do this type of stuff. Uh, normally we do it obviously face to face. And I know Jax, you know, about a year or two ago started doing some of them uh, virtually as well, just to kind of be as convenient to you guys as possible. 
Um, and I think that's, that really stands for what we stand for and what we do. Um, you know, Samantha Mundell and, and Sam Jacks uh, really do uh, have a student-centric focus. And I think that is also how predominantly our faculty is as well. Um, and you're gonna find that, especially as you continue to investigate PT programs in this country. Um, the other thing you'll find in, in, the, in the faculty that we have here is that there's an enormous sense of pride in being a physical therapist or being you know, the, the educator of future physical therapists. Uh, and that's another predominant focus is as PT first. Uh, and and uh, again, I think it's gonna be obvious to you along the way and it's, I think it's obvious to our students as well uh, currently in the program. Uh, you know, so here at, at UCF, um, we like to interact with our students. We, you know, we like to help our students as much as possible, um, but we also challenge our students um, and we push them in the, in the way we think might be best. Um, and uh, we kind of have a high standard, uh, both for ourselves and for our students. Um, I know some faculty say it and I'll steal it from them, but they, we don't want the average students. We want excellence. You know, we want the excellent students and we want the students who want to be excellent. Um, if you want to be average, we don't want you. You know, like we want you to do better for yourself, for your patients, um, and for this program. Uh, I always say that the students are not my end customer, but the patients my students are going to treat are my end customer. You know, that's why I'm here as an, in education now is because I, I figured that is if I can help students be the best physical therapist they can, I am helping more patients in this world. Um, so anywhere there, there's my soapbox uh, for a hot minute. Um, you know, you'll find out a lot about the integration of what we do and the things that we do for the betterment of PT. Um, we love integrating alumni. We love integrating uh, the Central Florida community. You'll see how we get um, involved in events and activities all throughout uh, the, the Central Florida region and beyond. Uh, you'll find out how our faculty are clinical experts in various ways. Um, and uh, I think you'll also find out all the opportunities that exist even in Central Florida and Orlando if you're not from UCF. Um, you know, but the nice part about our program too is that we are a microcosm of UCF. UCF is this enormous institution. Well, we're, we're not enormous. You know, we can have some customizability uh, to the experiences of, of our students and faculty and staff. And you know, we're, we're on, on purpose, we're a bit of, a bit you know, below average in terms of the size of our program and the size of our student populations. So that's purposeful. We've resisted the temptation to expand the program and such because we feel like we can create a better and more meaningful experience for our students um, in the end products. Our outcomes are excellent. Um, you know, the students are achieving exceptionally well. You can look at the licensure pass rates. I have data all over our websites because I'm impressed, you know, by how good they're doing. Um, and that's a good place to be is having students in your alumni impress you. Um, so that, that makes us feel good and that makes us want to keep doing this more and more and more. Uh, you know, a little bit about me, you can see some of my stuff there, but I've been, I've been the program director here for since 2011. I don't know how many years that has been. Um, so I've been the program director since then. I've been a faculty since late 2007. Uh, prior to that, I've been practicing in orthopedics and sports. Uh, it's been my, my predominant clinical areas of focus. Uh, now I kind of am split between administration, some research, and uh, uh, you know, teaching some of the uh, orthopedics uh, and kinesiology type content areas. So you know, as you guys go through this process of investigating, you know, really uh, do your diligence, you know, inform yourself as best as, po as possible. And I think this is a, uh, an instrumental step in being here and showing up for things like this. So uh, best of luck to y'all. Awesome. All right. Um, so I don't know, I can't really see all of the faculty at once. So faculty, if you're in here, when your uh, screen comes up, feel free to unmute and just pop in and uh, introduce yourself. 
I don't believe Dr. Rothschild is in here. Um, so just a brief overview of Dr. Rothschild. I can uh, do it quick. Um, okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm fast. Uh, yeah. Dr. Dr. Rothschild is our superstar educator. Um, she uh, is orthopedics and sports board certified as well. Um, she has been with us for over 10 years as well, I believe 11 years now. Um, she teaches a lot of our basic uh, clinical care type courses as well as orthopedics. Um, and she recently developed a pain science course, which is really, really cool because not many programs in the country have done that yet. Um, that's like a new wave of things that are happening. Um, so she is fantastic in the classroom. She is um, also, uh, you know, an avid uh, athlete. She's a triathlete, um, Boston Marathon, a whole lot of times. Um, and she, uh, again, has passions for endurance sports and female athlete. Uh, she's also uh, just recently became certified in pelvic health. Uh, physical therapy, which is also a kind of a, a blossoming area of, of specialty practice. Um, so you can see some of her things there. Who's next, Jax? I see Dr. Dawson right here. Yes, I am here. So I can, I can kind of introduce myself. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Nikki Dawson. I uh, just finishing my fifth year here. Um, I am I, I, I teach mostly the geriatric content. So that's really what you guys would know me for. Um, I started in outpatient orthopedics and then made a switch over to skilled nursing and then went and furthered my education, getting a PhD in adult development and aging psychology. Um, and then after that, moved down here from Cleveland, Ohio, and you know, the rest is kind of history. So welcome. So excited to have you guys on. Um, looking forward to hearing what questions you have. Um, don't hesitate to ask because you got us right in front of you, okay? Next is Dr. Tucker. I don't believe Dr. Tucker is here. Um, Dr. Tucker is our pediatric specialist. Um, she's been here for, I uh, think, about 12 years now. Um, Dr. Tucker, uh, it's kind of like pediatrics and neuro um, is our major fo focal points. Um, she is also the director of UCF Go Baby Go, uh, which is, if you can, you can find a lot of information about Go Baby Go nationally in our chapter here at UCF, so she's the leader of that integrates a, a tremendous amount of students into those activities, um, has a real big passion for inclusion and outreach, and um, I would say inclusive uh, services and education for students with special, or uh, children with, with special needs. Uh, Dr. Tucker also works uh, as a, a co-advisor on the Student Assisted Workout Program with the Rec and Wellness Center for students with both physical and intellectual disabilities. Um, and so she, again, she's our, our specialist in that area and she's really branching out a lot of her outreach activities into uh, other disciplines as well with uh, exceptional education, psychology and, and, and communication disorders. She also is, uh, is kind of co-lead on this Nights on the Go Cafe, uh, which you find in our HPA or Health Science Building uh, on campus, uh, and that has uh, stroke and traumatic brain injury survivors who are working in that cafe uh, with uh, Aramark employees. So that's Dr. Tucker. Dr. Haney is uh, another specialist kind of in orthopedics, but more so with an area on spine, uh, spine and manipulative interventions. Um, so Dr. Haney has a, a bit of a background. His undergraduate degree was in athletic training, um, but then has received then several other degrees in physical therapy. And, the, and that was his focal point in his PhD as well. Uh, so spine intervention are his biggest passions. Um, and he has been here, I believe, for 14 or 16 years, 16 years now, I believe. Uh, that he has been here and uh, teaching uh, some of the orthopedics, advanced orthopedics and manipulative intervention type courses. Who's next? I saw Dr. Neely here. Good morning. I think it's still morning, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Laurie Neely and I am the Director of Clinical Education. So, my role here at UCF is to secure um, placements and then kind of assign you placements and then oversee you when you go out into the clinic. 
Um, and a really cool thing about our program is while you're here with us, you get to do four clinical education experiences. Um, it is an awesome opportunity for you to kind of go out into the clinic and practice everything that you've learned. A lot of schools have gotten away from offering um, quite so many different opportunities. A lot of places only offer two or three um, clinical education experiences. So while we kind of strive to have the same, or we're required to have a certain number of weeks, we are um, happy that we can offer four different experiences. So you can have four different settings. Um, my background is primarily in acute care. So I'm board certified in uh, neurophysical therapy, but primarily neurotrauma and cardiopulmonary is where I practice in the acute care hospital. So welcome, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, Dr. Beato uh, has been with us about, I think, uh, just over five years as well. Um, Dr. Beato is board certified in geriatrics and neuro. Um, interestingly, and so obviously those are the areas that he is involved in instructional capacity for the program. Uh, but interestingly, he's also the, uh, the director of our uh, neurologic residency program, which is a partnered residency program with Orlando Health. Uh, so we, we have a resident now, I think we're on our third uh, year in that uh, process. And so that resident is a post-grad, so someone who's graduated with their DPT and pursuing advanced specialization in neuro. Uh, so the, the cool part about that is we've really made purposeful attempts to try to integrate that resident as much as possible into some of the education curriculum into that uh, Nights on the Go Cafe uh, that you see on the first floor of our building um, and in, the, cl and in the, the classroom and interaction with students. Uh, and then also uh, that's kind of our pipeline into the clinics of Orlando Health. So we do have a lot of integration uh, with several of their neurologic uh, clinics uh, because of that relationship. Um, so there's some of uh, the additional information about uh, Dr. Beato, uh, but he is, again, a, both a geriatric neuro specialist. Dr. Stock is here. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Matt Stock. I'm one of the um, non-clinical faculty members, so my background is uh, purely academically oriented. I did a PhD at the University of Oklahoma in exercise physiology. So all of my formal background is in um, ex-phys, kinesiology. Um, my, uh, my research interests, I spent a good chunk of time on research uh, uh, pertain to kind of better understanding the neuromuscular system's role in uh, muscle strength and also muscle weakness. My role in the program is I, is I teach the physiology content within the first year, so the first year students, um, and then really all throughout the, the program, one of the things that's um, a little bit unique um, uh, about our program is that we do have a fairly rigorous research emphasis. Um, so even though you may want to go to school to, to work full time as a, as a clinician, it's really important for you to have a good understanding of, uh, of research and Really, my goal is for everyone to be um, comfortable consumers of research so that you're able to, you know, do something that might seem kind of intimidating or scary now, which is like go into a medical journal and read and understand um, and, and actually be able to do that and maybe even like it um, to some extent too. So um, that's one of the things that's really cool. I've had students over the last um, couple months, something that's been kind of interesting, some of our third year students have... Um, sent me articles, sent me research studies, or sent me emails saying that they've been reading research studies about COVID, which is kind of cool. So they basically have the, the comfort level to be able to, you know, download medical articles, medical journals, and and read those things. Um, students in our program are also engaged in a research project, and I kind of help assist with that. Um, so that's another thing you can ask questions about, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Um, so that, yeah, that's really my role in the program. I have looked, enjoys uh, bad softball, fishing. So yeah, good stuff. Uh, welcome and um, make sure you, answer, you ask any questions that you may have.
Oh. Hey guys, I guess it's my turn. Um, my name is Samantha Mundell and I am the academic manager for the DPT program. I'm also the admissions committee chair, so I have the privilege of reviewing all of your applications and setting up the interviews and kind of leading that process. I've been uh, with UCF DPT for oh, over 11 years now. Um, so love working with this group of faculty. The students are amazing. Uh, it's a wonderful job. I'm gonna stay on chat uh, through most of today just to make sure we get everyone's answers or questions answered. Um, so make sure you use that feature while you're listening. And uh, well, thanks for joining us. We'll, we'll be talking to you through the day. And I realized that I never added uh, a slide for myself. So I'll do a quick <laughs> introduction um, of who's talking to you uh, during all of the admissions bit. Um, so my name is Samantha Fraley, I go by Jax. I've been with the program for about four years now. Um, I, like Dr. Papian said, uh, we, the unique thing about our program is that we have two staff members, Sam and I, uh, who are here to cater toward the needs of students. Um, so both of us have master's degrees in higher education uh, and we have training in, in this, in helping you guys have the, the most beneficial experience, whether it be the application process or as a student. Um, and outside of events like this, I do a few other events uh, for the program for our current students, like the white coat ceremony, the hooding ceremony, um, a few different things for welcoming in the new class. Uh, and then I also do a lot of the, the admin stuff um, so that's me. Uh, now we're going to go back to Dr. Pabian and he's going to chat a little bit about what it is to be a PT. Hey Jax, before we do that, Dr. Tucker just joined us, so uh, maybe we can let her say hi real quick. Yeah, Dr. Tucker. Hi, good morning. I apologize. I'm a few minutes late. I was actually um, on Zoom with one of the students. Final exams are next week, so um, everybody's uh, anxiety levels are high and there's lots of questions. My exam's on Monday, so um, I apologize. But we're excited to see all of you all. Um, I think that Dr. Pavian told you a little bit about myself. I am a board certified pediatric specialist um, and I teach the neuro component of the program and the pediatric component. And I'm also the director of UCF Go Baby Go. Um, other than that, I um, have been at UCF since 2008. I love um, being a part of the UCF community. I am, think we're exceptionally spoiled by having amazing students. And um, that really is the highlight of my day is when I get to spend the day with them, interacting and watching them um, come in as students and leave as PT. So um, we're excited that you're here and any questions that you have, um, we're happy to answer them. Otherwise, you've got great resources in Sam and Jax and Dr. Pavian that can answer questions about um, kind of getting through the process so that we can see you on the other side. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, you know, so I, I, there's a, some information slides here and I, I recognize that some of, of you all participating here are at different levels of your awareness and knowledge. So I try to tie this together as much as possible, you know, for you know all of our audience here. Um, but I think this this statement here is not always well known by our, our applicants or people who are just interested in physical therapy. But this is actually the vision of physical therapy of the APTA uh, with physical therapy that you know a physical therapist we want to in that, that center statement there, transforming society by optimizing movement to improve the human experience. You say that again and think about it, you know, transforming society by optimizing movement to improve the human experience. That ties together all areas of physical therapy practice. You know, that kind of, that level really links to the sub-focus areas, the specialty practice areas, because 
you guys all have very finite knowledge usually about what physical therapy does and who physical therapists treat. Um, but this type of statement links together all of those kind of areas. Um, and I think it's important that you go into any PT program knowing that you're going to be learning about all of these areas that you may not have known before. You may not have appreciated before. You may not have the same depth of knowledge. Uh, when you go into a PT program, you're going to have to be competent in all areas of these, you know, all of these areas that you're going to see here, you know, in the ensuing slides. You're going to have to be equally able to uh, direct the plan of care for a child with cerebral palsy, uh, a, a 90 year old older adult with dementia, and you know, a 24 year old football player with an ACL tear. You know, and those are dramatically different. Um, but what we're doing is looking at you know, optimized movement to improve the human experience. You know, that's the core coming back to that area. So, Jeff. You know, in the history of, his, of PT, you know, this really kind of started, you know, back, you know, in the World War eras. Um, so this is why PTs, generally, there is more females than males in PT, and there always has been, um, generally because it started when the World War is where all the males were out fighting and such. And there was a tremendous need, and that was really the birth of PT. And really, the hospitals were the birthplace of physical therapy. You know, that's where everything kind of originated. Uh, go ahead, Jack. You know, so when we say, what, is it, what does a PT do? Like, this is busy slide in thinking of all of these areas of what a PT does. Multiple practice areas, multiple settings, and that's actually kind of cool. You know, that kind of, like, having that breadth of areas of understanding and knowledge helps you, um, not only, but take pieces from your knowledge areas from all those populations and packaging that into your patient. Um, but also it gives you a, a, a level of flexibility. You know, you can change the, your practice area. You know, you can change from one practice area to another. Um, and we do see that in some of our uh, alumni. I, I see that in some of my colleagues who are physical therapists, but they, that they might be practicing in more than just one area. So that's the other thing is while some people choose to specialize, you don't have to specialize. You can kind of maintain a breadth areas of focus. Go ahead, Jack. Okay. Um, and um, I think Jax, we don't have all the other areas of like the subdomains there, right? Go back one slide and then I want to point out a few things that you guys, as okay. you see this. Um, so when you look at these specific areas, number one, you know, you're seeing workplace type things in that bottom left corner. So in, in the Midwest and, you know, in the rural areas, there's physical therapists working in the workplace. Um, there are physical therapists on just about every military base in this world, um, in the U.S. military. There are physical therapists who work with sport teams. Um, there are physical therapists at every Lanuba campus in this world. Um, even the travel shows have physical therapists who work for them. Um, you know, obviously we see a lot in the hospital areas, but Jax, if you even go back one more slide, I recall uh, in this bottom right is what you guys are familiar with, with thinking about hospital-based physical therapy. But even in that bottom with the person who's on a ventilator, there are physical therapists in the intensive care unit. There are physical therapists in the critical care units. There are physical therapists in the emergency room treating patients in that capacity. You know, there are physical therapists who are working, who are going home to home, house to house. Uh, there are some working in schools. There are some working in sports teams. So that's a very diverse areas of focus. But then also, as you can see, you know, right dead center, there's the girl in the purple shirt, you know, with, with some kind of apparatus to her. Physical therapists work with a lot of different other providers, um, not only healthcare providers, but even, you know, biomedical engineers, you know, so even prosthetists, you know, amputees, um, we work in helping and assisting the divine of, of prosthetic devices. Uh, so again, just a very widespread area of uh, that, that can be focused. 
But then last, in some areas, you know, in that bottom center where you see someone grappling someone's ankle there, um, you know, sometimes some physical therapists are just working with their own two hands. You know, they're doing, we are doing manipulative interventions um, and high level manipulative interventions. Uh, we're doing thrust manipulations uh, to cervical spines, lumbar spines, and even the extremities um, for the betterment of promoting movement of those joints. So, okay, Jax, you can move back forward. And so educational requirements. Jax, do you want to cover this? Uh, so in order to be a PT, uh, you can't just jump into the workforce. So you do need to first get a DPT, and that's what our program is. It's a Doctor of Physical Therapy degree. Uh, so currently there are over 261 colleges and universities offering PT programs. Um, at this point and since 2015, all of them have transitioned to the doctorate. Uh, so way back when there were bachelor's degrees or master's degrees, uh, for PT, and now it is only a doctorate program. Uh, and then in Florida specifically, there are about 13 programs that are offering a DPT degree. Uh, and then after you get the DPT, what happens? So to get a PT license, after graduation, you have to pass uh, a national exam. It's called the NPTE. And then there are other requirements depending on what state you live in. So there might be um, different laws, tests that you need to pass. Um, other requirements are going to be, it's, it's all depending on what state you live in. And then in terms of PT salary, uh, so keep in mind that the numbers here are our median pay and top pay. So that's not what you're getting straight out of, of PT school. Um, but just to give you an idea of what an experienced PT might earn, uh, median pay is about 88,000 and then top pay is about 122,000. And those things really do depend not only on the position title, uh, but the years of experience, um, whether or not you have specializations in something where you're practicing, exactly what kind of clinic you're practicing in. So those numbers can change depending on, on where and what you're doing. Uh, we do have a lot of growth within the PT profession. So the 10-year job growth is predicted to be about 28%. And currently there are an estimated 239,800 total PT jobs across America. Uh, and you can see that the quality of life ratings are pretty high for PTs. Um, there's a, a good amount of stress just because of the nature of the job, but it's not uh, incredibly <laughs> an unattainable profession in terms of flexibility and life satisfaction and all of those things. So Dr. Pabian mentioned areas of specialty. Oh, he's going to keep going. There we go. Um, so uh, the American Board of Physical Therapy Specialties is who mandates all of this testing. Um, so I mentioned the NPTE, that licensure exam that you take uh, after graduation. If afterwards you want to get uh, an area of specialty, then you pursue one of these that are recognized specialties. So orthopedics, neurology, sports, geriatrics, oncology, pediatrics, women's health, clinical electrophysiology, and cardiopalm. Jax, can I hop in for a sec? Yes, you can. Um, wound management has also oh, yes. just, just been added as a specialty. So just so now there's 10, just so, you, just so you're aware. Yes. And I don't think that's actually on their website right now because I did double check that. So that's something good to know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so wound management is, is our newest specialty. Yeah. And while Dr. Havian was introducing faculty and while they were introducing themselves, uh, you may have noticed that all of our faculty have specializations in these areas. So you have um, pediatric specialists teaching your pediatrics. You have um, a faculty who have women's health specialties. All of these things uh, are essentially just the next step in education. Um, and it's, Dr. Pabian, do you wanna talk a little bit about what that path looks like to gaining a specialty? Yeah, in, in terms of specializations, you need to have a, a requisite number of hours in that area. 
um, which generally usually takes a few years, depending on what practice that you're in, um, or the kind of streamlined process is to do a residency in it. It's kind of like a fast track. Um, so those are two different things and those are debatable about what's the better option. You'll get a different answer depending on who you ask. Um, and it probably always depends on where, you, you know, what your normal job would be anyway. Uh, so that's generally the process, but then it, it requires a pretty difficult examination. Um, interestingly enough, I have two fun facts or actually several. Um, one, I think we have as a faculty, I think it was 60% of our faculty have a uh, specialization and the national average, I think is still at about 40% of the PT program uh, faculty have specializations. Um, the other is the, the American Board of Physical Therapy Specialists has councils in all of these areas. Um, currently right now, Dr. Dawson, you're on geriatrics. Rick, uh, Dr. Beato is on neuro specialty councils. Um, Dr. Rothschild is on the Sports Specialty Council, and I just cycled off the Sports Specialty Council. So there's only four representatives in each of those areas. So it was funny that, or not funny, but interesting that last year, four of our faculty were on those councils, and that's unheard of, um, comparatively speaking, because those are nationwide councils. But that shows some of the activity of, of our faculty into just doing more. Um, last is that, um, you know, uh, Jackson said about our faculty or, you know, the specialists are treating in these areas, are, are teaching, are part of these areas. Even oncology, which just began, our, our adjunct alumni who's been teaching that section in lymphedema, I know just got board certified in oncology. Um, so that's even a new board certification. So when we as a faculty don't have the, you know, the ultimate representation in some of these even smaller areas, uh, we have alumni and adjuncts or local clinicians who we pipe in to get in the classroom to help to teach you. All right, so a little bit more about uh, specifically our program. Uh, so we are that DPT degree that I mentioned, the professional uh, doctoral degree. We have 114 graduate credit hours that are past the bachelor's degree that happen over nine consecutive semesters. So it's a three year program and it's a lockstep curriculum. So what that means is that your curriculum is laid out for you at the very beginning and you're following that curriculum step by step. We have, uh, as Dr. Neely mentioned, four clinical rotations throughout your second and third year, totaling in about 36 weeks of full time training. Uh, you also have a research component. So we might not be a research doctoral program, but there is in fact a lot of research within the program. Uh, and all of that culminates in a final capstone project. And we'll chat a little bit more about that later. And then graduates of the program are then eligible to take that MPTE national board exam. Uh, just a little bit of a bragging point for our program. We do have 100% pass rate but uh, specifically to PT programs in general, 100% pass rate isn't necessarily the bragging right. Uh, most programs get 100% pass rate because you can take it multiple times. Um, so Dr. Pabian, do you happen to remember the stats for our first time? Our, first, our first attempt licensure pass rates have been above the state and national average every year that we've been a BT, DPT degree. So every year we have beaten the state, all the universities in the state and the country in their averages for pass rates. Um, I think it's been six of the 10 graduating cohorts have achieved a 100% first attempt pass rate. Um, and then the other data even in the, in the two year averages, we still hover somewhere between the top seven to 8% in the country for our two year pass rates. That's been where, we'll be, where we've been landing. Um, so again, I told you I've been impressed. Um, it's, it's been pretty impressive. Um, but then even on top of that, even, even the scores for things that I'm starting that I pay a lot of attention to as far as yeah, you get a 600, but some our students are hitting 680, 700, you know, on an 800 scale. That's, again, when the national average is like a, 
a 650 in our average, our students are hitting like a 710. Holy cow, you know, that's enormously beating the national average in terms of a lot of the scores. So those are the things that we pay uh, some special attention to. So when you're looking at other programs, uh, keep that in mind. Ask not only about their MPTE pass rate, but also their first time pass rate. Um, that's going to give you a lot of, of valuable information for other programs. So just a brief overview of our curriculum. Uh, we are essentially in four different parts of your curriculum that are happening over those three years. We start out right off the bat with foundational sciences. So you have your students uh, taking anatomy, physiology, your neuro, your farm, and your kinesiology to really get that groundwork of, of the human body of movement. And then you're going to move into your clinical sciences. Um, so that's a quick list there of those. And then uh, we mentioned it briefly, but we also have a research curriculum that happens over the three years. Um, Dr. Stock, do you mind uh, chatting a little bit about the research curriculum and the capstone? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Um, yeah, so as Jack said, one of the things that is um, uh, a little bit unique about our program is, um, is the research emphasis. And another thing that's kind of unique is that the research curriculum is kind of embedded throughout. So it's not like you, you know, have your research class first and then you don't think about it ever again. The classes are, are kind of spread out a little bit. Um, essentially, in terms of the, the specific coursework, in the first year, there's research methods, which is kind of the foundational aspects of research, where we talk about um, things like identifying and finding literature, you know, what it's like to develop a research study, um, what it's like to um, go through the IRB process, ethics, all that fun stuff. <laughs> um, and then towards the second year, we have a... Um, research applications course where we um, dive a little bit more into um, reading. Um, we get into some statistics. I call it sort of stats light, so to speak, just so you feel comfortable kind of reading the method section or the uh, results section, you don't just skip over it. And then I think one of the things that's kind of most unique is that um, all of our students get into groups typically of three um, and identify a research advisor and go through the process of actually carrying out a research project. Um, and so by the end of it, sort of the, the culminating experience in that very last semester is the presentation of your work, um, both, both to the faculty, we put on a symposium as well, um, which is really great to see the students do work. And I think, um, you know, all of our students have the opportunity and most of them do over the last couple of years the majority of our students um, present at conferences um, at a minimum, you know, these things are at a state level, but more often than not, they're, they're at, at the national level. Um, and many of our students also go on to fully having their work published, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, so that's really exciting. So th the bottom line is that um, if you come here and you're part of the program, you'll get more research than you, you think you need. And I think one of the things that's really cool is, is having the opportunity to actually complete a project and to um, you know, actually contribute to the, to the field's body of knowledge. And I think that's one of the fun things about research and about science is, from my perspective anyway, this is just kind of my opinion, you know, it's really fun to teach stuff um, you know, that people before me have, have found out, but it's even more exciting to kind of be on the cutting edge of what's the newest stuff in the field. Um, and so you'll have that opportunity to say, I'm really, you know, interested in this and uh, come up with a research question and dig through the literature to find your hypotheses um, and then ultimately present your findings. So um, it's really, it's fairly comprehensive um, in nature. And ultimately the goal here is just, you know, like I said before, we're not, we don't try to make students into, into scientists or researchers per se, uh, but basically to have a comfort level to where you can learn on your own and be able to kind of detect stuff that's fishy and just doesn't sound quite right to really kind of make you a, a healthy kind of skeptic from the, a healthcare provider perspective. Awesome, thank you. Okay, 
So we're going to move into admissions. So at this point, I know that a lot of you are going to have tons of questions. Um, feel free to plop them in the chat, but just know that we will be covering most things, especially any COVID-19 changes. So general program admissions, we only have one application cycle every year. Uh, so that is going to be November 1st as a deadline, and we usually open the beginning of July. Um, so right now we're in the middle of that admission cycle uh, for the following summer semester start date. So the program begins summer C, which is about mid-May usually. Uh, so for example, people who are applying by this November would be starting uh, this upcoming May. Uh, we usually have somewhere between 600 to 1100 applications. It really, it varies from year to year. Yes, last year we had about 600. Um, and then a couple years before we had almost 1200. Uh, but generally we're around that, that 700 to 900 range. And then from that total, you're going to see 100 about applicants uh, selected to interview with their faculty and we will go more into detail about the interview process as well and then finally from that 100 38 students are admitted into the program every year so all of this goes through ptcast so if you've started the application process you know kind of what that beast is uh, and let's go a little bit more into what we're looking for through that application um, so we have uh, the requirement of a bachelor's degree prior to beginning our program. You can still have it in progress during your application, um, but it does need to be ended by that spring semester, by the end of that spring semester before the summer C start date. Uh, we also have a list of prerequisite courses. So all of these things are links and I will be sending this out to everyone who is RSVP'd. Um, but our prerequisite courses will be in more detail a little bit later as well. We have a GRE requirement. We have 50 observation hours with a licensed PT, three letters of recommendation, one of which is from APT, and then that final interview step. And then uh, we have two steps of the application. The first being that PTCAS application due November 1st, and then the second being that UCF graduate application, the supplemental application that is through the UCF admissions process. And that is due a little bit later on December 1st. So the thing that everyone's been waiting for, COVID-19 updates. Now that you know the basic outline of admissions requirements, know that we have changed a few things for the process this year. The prerequisite courses uh, generally all things must be face-to-face -face for any lab portions. Uh, any lectures can be online, so you can take hybrid courses if you want, or you can take fully online courses for things like biology, statistics, and psychology that don't require a lab. Um, this cycle, we are allowing from spring, summer, and uh, this fall semester until further notice, online labs to take place. We also are allowing satisfactory or past grades. Different schools may have a different language for that, um, but we are limiting the number of courses that you are using uh, those grades for towards the prerequisite requirements. So you can have a maximum of two satisfactory or past grades going towards the prerequisite courses or three total if you're combining them with credits from uh, AP or IB testing. So if you have, um, let's say, two AP courses that you want to replace a prerequisite course for, then you can only have one satisfactory or pass grade. Um, so a few more things. The GRE, we are still 100% requiring it, but the good news is that ETS is allowing online testing. Uh, so if you go and you register for the GRE currently on ETS, they do have a lot of uh, literature on there about the online testing process and you can register now I believe until September 30th is when they're currently uh, cutting off online testing registration. So do that as soon as possible. 
Uh, we are now going to only recommend for this cycle those 50 observation hours. It's not required, it is recommended. And then for the three letters of recommendation, that one that's required from a PT is going to be recommended this cycle as well. Um, so make sure that you're still getting those three letters in, one of which is usually required to be from a PT, but is this cycle only recommended. And then the, uh, a big change that I've seen asked in the chat as well is that the interviews are going to be virtual. So um, the interview dates are still listed and we'll chat a little bit more about what that's going to look like. Um, but it is going to be virtual this cycle. And all of these things, let me make sure that you can see what I'm sharing right now. One moment. Um, all of these things are available on our website as well. You cannot see what I'm sharing. Here we go. Um, so if you are on our website, you can go on over to the admissions tab. And then this giant box right here has all COVID-19 updates. So if you're ever not sure about the changes that are being made, just head on over here. You can read more about it. There is a link to the at-home testing here as well. Um, so utilize the Jax, we love where we will be placing any up. So, oh, are we good? Yeah, I think it may have been me that froze then because I stopped hearing you. So I think it was my fault. My connection is unstable. Um, so if yeah, you, we, we missed a little bit of what you just said, Jax. Okay. If you, you want to repeat yourself. Yeah, if you didn't see the website share, just know that uh, it's on there. It's on the admissions tab. Um, and any updates that we may have to the uh, admission cycle regarding COVID-19 updates will be listed on that site. Uh, so if you have any other concerns um, that aren't listed on that site, let's say that you have trouble procuring transcripts or something like that, um, just know that PTCAS also has a lot of information for applicants. So uh, on the PTCAS website, there is a list of application or applicant recommendations. Uh, and then on the application itself, there will also be a box for you to fill out any other concerns that you may have. And we will be looking over that. So if there's anything that you think that we need to consider for your application regarding COVID-19 impacts, please list those out. We will be looking at all of that on your applications. Yeah, and I just want to re-emphasize that to any of our applicants that are applying for this cycle. Those questions are going to be really important for you to answer thoroughly and honestly to let us know the impact that the pandemic has had on your application process, getting hours, getting letters, um, really anything on your you know, economic impact, on your grades, all of that stuff is information that the program is going to be looking at really closely. We know these are really rough times for everybody and applying uh, to PT school during a pandemic is far from ideal. So we wanna make sure that we're giving you as much benefit of the doubt as we possibly can. We're all human beings. We're all trying to do the best we can with the resources that we have. So if something comes up, if there are questions, if you're not sure about anything, especially this year, please just contact me or Jax um, and we will help any way that we can. Um, so I just wanna reemphasize that we are, you know, not gatekeepers to the program, we are resources. And if there are things that we can do to make this easier on you, now of course the work really falls on your shoulders for most of it, but we can help maybe with some of the things that you just aren't sure about. Thank you, Sam. All right. Uh, so PTCAS, the giant monster, um, all of the application materials are going to be submitted through PTCAS, including transcripts, including those letters of recommendation, including verifying those hours. And if you're on the PTCAS website, there is a drop down for applicants to look over each of those sections and get more details about how exactly each of those sections are completed. 
Uh, and then when you're applying, make sure that you're looking at the program requirements for each and every program. Uh, the things that we're talking about today are specifically for our program. Every program is going to have slight differences, whether it be in their observation hours, their prerequisite courses. So just look at all of those details. And on the PTCAS or on the PTCAS website, you can also see those differences from program to program. You can filter uh, programs by state as well. So I urge you to go on there and make sure that you're crossing all your T's, dotting all your I's. A little bit more information about the UCF graduate supplemental application. It is due December 1st. We do have that later date because we know that it's, it's usually the afterthought to the giant monster PTCAS. Uh, and that supplemental application is also required. So you do have to do both applications in order for your application to be considered for the program. It's just a $31 supplemental fee and then essentially filling out demographic information and then that's it. So you're not submitting any of those transcripts, GRE scores, anything like that to this application. You're essentially just entering your information into the UCF system because we have to have you do that. <laughs> that's, that's the only reason why this application is part of the process. Um, so your bachelor's degree can be in any discipline. We don't require a specific major. Generally, our applicants are uh, from some sort of health um, or science background just because there's some overlap there with both the prerequisite courses and interest. But we've also had students who are um, from a business background, from an arts background, from communications, uh, and there really is no weight on one over the other. Um, we do require those prerequisite courses regardless of major. Um, and then I mentioned that you can have that degree in pro progress at the time of your application, as long as you are graduating by the end of your spring semester. And then uh, keep in mind that all transcripts must be sent directly to PTCAS. So that's not only um, your, your main undergraduate institution, but that's also uh, if you got your AA at another institution, if you took um, some classes at your community college in high school, anywhere that you got college credit, you need to send those transcripts in to PTCAS from those institutions. All right, so the GRE is the highest weighted individual portion of uh, the first section of the application process. Uh, so in terms of the things that we're looking at prior to the interview, if you're looking at like a little scale, it's the GRE, then the prerequisite GPA, then the last 60 credit hour GPA. So for the GRE, we do super score. So that means that you can take the GRE multiple times and we'll take the highest of each individual section. So the quantitative, the verbal and the writing. And then we'll combine those highest scores together to create your score. You should take the GRE uh, within five years of applying to the program. There is uh, a, a uh, they, they stop being valid scores after five years and then at least two weeks before that November 1st deadline. Um, so I do usually caution applicants to take it at least a month before that deadline if you're being just super cautious um, because sometimes the scores can take a while to get in. Uh, you uh, also need to keep in mind if you do plan on taking it again, you need to wait, I believe it's 21 days in between each test. So you need to plan that out. You also need to plan out time to study in between each test. Uh, so now is a great time to take advantage of the online option. So here's that link again. I will be sending this application or this uh, PowerPoint out to everyone. So take advantage of the at-home ETS testing. And then when you're done with the GRE, at the very end of the test, you are opted to send out your scores to the institutions that you're applying to. Each of those schools are going to have their own PTCAS code. Uh, so if you're starting to type in UCF uh, when you're done taking the GRE, sometimes a different code can pop up for us and it starts with a five. Don't choose that one choose specifically the UCF DBT PT CAS code, which is 3871. And we have that listed everywhere. So keep in mind that that is the code. 
So, boop, boop, boop. prerequisite courses. Uh, we have a list of prerequisite courses on our admissions page. I believe that there's also a slide about these as well. Um, our minimum prerequisite GPA is a 3.0. That means that you also have to get at least a C or higher in each course, but we do highly recommend retaking Cs, not only because these prerequisite courses are going to be the foundational knowledge for your curriculum within the program, uh, but also because one C will drastically lower that prerequisite GPA. Um, generally, if I advise students to retake a C for the prerequisite courses, it boosts their GP up by at least 0.2. Uh, so during the application process, you can only have two prerequisite courses in progress in the fall and one in the spring of your application year. So if you are applying this cycle, for example, uh, two in this fall, one in the spring prior to your intended May start date. Preference may be given to those who are applying by November 1st with all of their prerequisite courses completed. Uh, and this is because we, we do see the bigger picture uh, for those students. We see the full prerequisite GPA, um, but we also consider all students who are applying. Courses older than 10 years are not accepted. So if you have prerequisite courses older than that, you will need to retake them. Curriculum changes drastically over 10 years. And then online courses are accepted for any lectures, though all labs need to be face-to-face -face and less online due to COVID-19. And then fall grades in the academic update period. On PTCAS, there is a follow-up application of sorts if you have courses in progress in the fall. Uh, and that's the academic update period. I don't believe they've updated those dates, uh, but just to give you an idea, last year's academic update period was between December 16th and January 15th. So that's after the fall semester is over. And that gives you a chance to update your grades within the PTCAS applications. So we get more of a picture of what your prerequisite GPA is, and we see that you're completing those courses. So um, I saw a few people asking about averages. So just to give you an idea of the, the competitive nature of the program, our last class, class of 2023, had GRE averages of 153 for quantitative, 153 for verbal, and four for writing analysis. And then the prereq GPA average was a 3.75, and then the last 60 credit hour GPA uh, or the upper level GPA average was a 3.8. So these things do fluctuate a little bit year to year, but generally we see around a 155 average for quantitative and verbal and a four for writing, and somewhere between uh, 3.7 to 3.75 usually for the two GPAs. Um, so keep in mind that these are not minimums, um, and they really do vary from student to student. And it's not that you have to meet each of these numbers to get into the program, um, but these are averages. So people are getting higher and lower than these numbers. So, uh, sorry, there's a question about the academic update period. You will be sending updated transcripts. Yes, so that is part of that as well. You go in and you update your curriculum um, manually, and then you also send updated transcripts. So observation hours, uh, once again, we do have a recommendation currently of 50 hours, but in general, it is a requirement to get 50 hours under a licensed physical therapist, and those must be verified through PTCAS. So PTCAS has two different ways that you can verify them, uh, one of which being a, a paper form um, that you have to download and submit after beginning the application. The other uh, way is to have them loaded. You're, you're essentially typing in your hours and then the contact information for the PT. And then they are contacted through PTCAS to go in and verify those hours. Uh, a variety of settings is recommended, but not required. Um, so in general, think of these observation hours as a way to really get to know more about the PT profession 
to learn more about whether or not this is what you want to do for the rest of your life, to learn whether or not this is something that you want to spend three years and a lot of money on. Um, ask PTs questions while you're doing this. Uh, and Dr. Dawson, are you available? You usually have great info to share about the observation hours. Yes, I, I am. I am here. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, I think exactly what you just said is perfect. I think a lot of times, um, you know, especially now that they're recommended versus required, um, you know, we have taken them out of kind of consideration because what people would do is if they didn't get into PT school, they would go get more hours. And that was not a, always the way to do it. So, you know, the other, the other thing that we see sometimes students do is they go and get their hours to try to learn how to be a PT. And then they come to the interview trying to impress us with everything that they know about being a PT. That is not what these hours are for. Um, you know, exactly like you just said, Jax, these hours are, because you shouldn't necessarily be treating a lot of patients because you're not a PT yet. You should be assisting, you know, PTs uh, during your volunteer hours. But then also the bigger thing, like Jack said, is really take these observation hours to make sure this is what you want to do. For the rest of your life and so you know i've had students come to me with observation hours and they literally sit in a corner and don't say a word um and they don't ask any questions i'm like H I, this is a waste of everybody's time um you know so asking questions what's the best part of your day what do you love about your job what do you hate about your job you know if you could do this all over again would you do it all over again these are the things you know because you're three years and i'm sure travis could uh could tell you about this is going to be lots of blood sweat and tears and so you want to make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons and that you actually love it and it's what you want to do you don't want to figure out in your second year you know huh i don't think i really like this um you know you want to know that before you interview and before you get in and so that's really what those inner you know those observation hours are for is to make sure that this is what you want to do so if you're not sure go go observe a, a nurse go observe a physician you know go observe a speech language pathologist you know go look at different health professions because you will find the click, you know, you'll find these are my people, um, you know, and, and that's really what this is for, um, you know, rather than just thinking this is what you want to do. Um, so hopefully that's helpful and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has as, you know, after Jax is done. Um, but I really encourage you guys to use those hours for that purpose, not trying to learn how to do stuff. We'll teach you how to do stuff once you get in because um, You'll probably learn wrong anyways and we'll have to unteach you and teach you the right way <laughs> i'm just kidding but um but really using those for for that for that purpose thanks Jax. and uh you reminded me that we do have a current student uh that's with us as well and um i know that he's been answering a few questions in the chat uh travis do you mind introducing yourself a little bit about what year you are in the program um where you went prior to the program for undergrad Anything else that you want to add? Sure. Um, like Jack said, uh, my name's Travis. I'm a second year student in the in the program. Um, uh, I have final exams next week, so that's really exciting. And uh, our cohort's about to go on our first internship in a couple of weeks. So it's kind of a, a pretty pretty exciting time in the program right about now in the second year. Um, I uh, I'm sort of one of those atypical students that uh, Jax mentioned earlier. Um, I'm 33, so I'm a little bit older than most of the people in my class. And I went to undergrad at Florida State University, where I studied um, Russian stuff. So when she says it doesn't matter what your undergraduate degree is in, she really, really means it because I spent a lot of years studying things that have nothing to do with PT. And here I am, and it's going well. So uh, Whatever you know, whatever you did before, whatever you're doing now, if you want to go be a PT, you can. Awesome, thank you, Travis. And he's in there to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, we want to make sure that you get not only the faculty and staff perspective of the program, uh, but also the student perspective because that's the side that you'll be on. So if you have any questions about being a student within the program, throw them out there for him. Um, so just uh, to end the observation hours, uh, keep in mind that you can start these at any point. They don't expire. You can start them now. You could have started them five years ago. Just get in that, that experience of being with a PT and learning more about that profession. Okay. 
Um, so recommendation letters, you do have uh, three total that are required. Generally, one must be from a PT. This cycle, it is re recommended rather than required. And then uh, other than that PT letter, these letters can be from anyone. So they can be from a professor, a supervisor, uh, maybe a community leader that you worked with. Uh, they can be from another PT if you want as well. We want these letters to best represent you. So that's your goal here. Uh, and these are also submitted directly through PT CAS. You are not submitting them as paper references. So PT CAS has a specific uh, a method of finishing these recommendation letters similar to the observation hours where you're going to uh, enter in their information. They are then contacted through PTCAS uh, and then they go in and they submit uh, sort of like a little survey uh, that PTCAS has formatted for them. All right, so the interview process. So the interview is a very heavily weighted portion of the process. Prior to the interview, we were looking at grades. We're looking at the GRE, we're looking at your GPAs. At this point, we're looking at who you are as a human being. We're looking at those recommendation letters. We're getting to know more about why you want to be a PT, um, work experience that you may have had, volunteer things that you've done, anything that you bring up during this interview. Uh, so from that academic blob of applicants. We are going to invite the top 100 or so applicants to interview with the program based on those scores. Uh, this upcoming cycle, our 2020 to 2021 interview dates are listed there. They're also listed on our website. These dates are set in stone. They are not negotiable. So if you are invited to interview, it will be on one of these days and if you can't make it, then we cannot guarantee you a slot. Um, so they will be virtual this year. So it makes things a little bit easier for people who might be traveling in from different parts of the state um, or even out of state. But uh, if you are invited to November 20th, we can't guarantee you a spot on December 16th. Um, having that in mind, we are, we are humans too. <laughs> we understand if you have something like a final exam during that time that you, you can't get around. Uh, we are generally able to work with things like that. Um, but if you're traveling with family, then you should have these dates solidified in your calendar now. So how will you know if you get an interview? That's one of my favorite parts of my job. I get to call you and I get to tell you that you're invited to an interview with the, uh, with the program. Uh, the interview format, usually, just to give you an overview of outside of this cycle, uh, it is an in-person interview generally, and it will be a small group interview. So you'll have about three applicants interviewed by about two faculty members and a current student. Um, and sometimes one of those faculty members might be an adjunct professor. They might be um, a community uh, contact that we have within the program. It's people who really are, are always there for the program. And we like to make sure that they have that kind of connection with our applicants as well, because they have that kind of connection with our students. Um, so you'll have that small group interview. You will then go back with that group that you interviewed with, and then go to another room with new faculty, but the same interviewees and interview again. Um, so just a little bit about the interview expectations. Uh, we are there to learn more about you. Um, we are not expecting rehearsed lines. Uh, the interview questions are really based on um, behavioral interview uh, lingo. So essentially, we're trying to learn more about difficult situations and how you might navigate them. Um, and then do any faculty want to kind of weigh in on the faculty side and what you're looking for in applicants and the interview process? I mean, I'm happy to say something. Yeah. Um, I would say that we, you know, we say this when we begin interviewing you all, but we really want you to interview us as a program as much as we interview you. So we really are looking at it being 
um, a conversation and an opportunity for you to learn more about the program. It really is about best fit on both sides. So we want you to come into that scenario. We understand that you'll be nervous, but hoping that you'll be as relax as possible, that you'll let us get to know you better, that you'll ask us questions that you need to know that help us get to know you better and really look at it um, as an opportunity for, for both of us um, to learn more about each other. So we try really hard to make it um, as relaxed of an experience as possible. Um, we don't have any right or wrong answers. We're trying to understand who you are, kind of what are experiences that have shaped you, um, and you know, really how do you communicate and interact with others? Those are really the things, those are the intangible things that we can't get out of your PT CAS application. It, you just can't capture all those parts of you on paper. So that, those are the things I think as a faculty we really look for. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and like Dr. Tucker said, this is really your opportunity to get to know the program uh, and to, to learn more about our faculty, our staff, um, the program itself. Uh, so with any program that you're applying to, if they have an interview, uh, definitely go and spend that time and learn more about the program face-to-face um, -face if available or virtually if, if it's during all of this nonsense. Uh, it's, it's important to figure out where you're going to be spending your next three years. All right, so after the interview, um, first of all, when will you know what happens? Uh, so these things usually vary uh, depending on when you have that interview. So if you're earlier in the process, if you're that first interview date, you might not hear back for a very long time. Uh, and if you're that last interview date, you still might not hear back for a while, um, but you'll have a, a shorter turnaround time. Um, and that's not always guaranteed. You might hear back from us immediately. So the way that we, we function with these interview dates and the offers that we give out is that we have a small group of students who are essentially preferenced and they hear back from us almost immediately. These are the exception to the rule. If you don't hear back from us immediately after an interview, that does not mean that you're not offered a spot. Uh, generally, most interviewees will hear back from us near the very end of the cycle. So at least a month usually after that last interview date. Uh, that is Sam's favorite part of her job when she gets to pick up the phone and call you and offer you a spot. Uh, so once again, we are physically calling you. Um, so keep in mind if at any point during this application cycle, if you see a 407-823 number, that's one of us either offering you an interview or offering you a spot, pick it up. <laughs> Uh, so we accept 38 students every year and the way that that works for the interview pool is that we offer 38 seats at a time. So if 38 seats are filled right off the bat, then that's it. And the rest of the 100 are essentially placed in a wait list. If any of those 38 offers do not take the offer, then we move down the wait list. Uh, and we give you much more in-depth information about this if you're offered an interview, um, but don't worry too much about the waitlist part of it. Um, but essentially, just keep in mind that we only offer as many spots as we have seats. So we won't throw out 50 offers hoping that only 38 say yes. At any point during the interview process, if you're not sure what's going on, uh, where you are on the waitlist, whether or not you're gonna hear back from us, we're here. Uh, so you can call me um, generally, depending on how busy Sam is, you can chat with her as well and see what's going on and we're here to answer those questions. Uh, if you are offered a spot within the program, you might have a short turnaround time or you might have a longer one. Um, generally, you have at least a week unless you're looking at um, further down the line uh, so if you're one of the first students to get an offer, then you might have a few weeks. If you're closer to that start date, because we just lost a seat and we are sending you out an offer, let's say a month before the program begins, you might only have a few days. Uh, so that's really going to vary depending on when that offer is sent out. Uh, keep in mind that if you get an offer and you accept it, 
um, we do not require a deposit. So we are holding you at your word. Uh, so if you say yes, that means that we expect you to be here in May. Uh, so if you're at any point deciding that that yes is actually a no, please let us know immediately because you're holding that seat for another applicant. Um, if you are on that wait list, if you're not one of that initial 38 spots offered, that does not mean that you're not in the program. Depending on the application cycle, uh, we have three tiers to the wait list. Depending on the application cycle, uh, we usually dip into the first tier. We sometimes dip into the second tier and sometimes we even dip into that third tier. Um, past the tiers, we won't tell you what number you're at because it's not really how that works. Um, but just know that if you're on the wait list, it's not the end of the road. You might still hear a call from us. Oh, I'm going to do that. All right. Okay. So a few keys to success uh, within the application. Shadow a PT as early as possible. We already chatted about that a little bit. Uh, check our requirements frequently, especially during this COVID-19 uh, nonsense. Make sure that you're looking at those changes and requirements and that you're looking at them for each program that you're applying to, keeping in mind that not only are the usual application requirements different per program, but COVID-19 changes might be different as well. Uh, your critical courses are anatomy and physiology. So if you have um, struggled in anatomy or physiology in the past, let's say that you had that C in one of those courses, we take that C, not only for your GPA, but also for your success in the program. And keep in mind that anatomy and physiology are, are courses that immediately within the first year of your program, you're having information just shoved down your throat for those courses. That is such important knowledge to have for the success of your time as a student within the program. Plan for the GRE, treat it as if it is a full semester course, a four credit hour course. So you're studying for that GRE like you would study for a semester long course. Don't procrastinate, be proactive, stay organized. If you have questions at any point, reach out to us, research each program. And then if you have questions about the PT profession, reach out to, to us as well. And just make sure that you know what you're getting into uh, and that this is your passion. This is what you really want to do. Jax, can I jump in for just a sec? Yes, you can. Um, had a couple of questions about applying more than once, reapplying. So one of the things that our program does, and I hope, and <laughs> I think other programs should maybe try to do this, but if you don't get in the first time, uh, we know how difficult the application process is. We know how competitive uh, PT school is. So what we will do is you can schedule a time to sit down with me, and I will go over your your specific application to the point and talk with you about what you can do to improve your chances of either getting an interview if you didn't receive an interview invitation or getting in uh, getting an invitation to the cohort I can't make guarantees of course but I can tell you um, you know some strategic things that you can do and if you follow them the likelihood of you know being a more successful candidate the next year is it goes up quite a bit so Keep that in mind, if it doesn't work out your first time, uh, I think it's a very small percentage of students that get admitted the first time. It's, uh, I think, around 12%, which is crazy. Um, so don't feel defeated, stick with it, contact us, and we'll try and help you um, for the next cycle. And our faculty absolutely love to see reapplicants. Thank you, Sam. All right, so we're going to do a quick little tour. Um, let me know if you can't hear the sound immediately. Uh, but this was a video that our, some of our current students created of our classroom spaces. Hi, I'm John Phillips. I'm a second year in the program. And right now we are hanging out in room 231. It's one of the two main classrooms that we use for the program. And um, we take a multitude of classes here, including geriatrics, advanced neuro, cardiopulmonary, kinesiology. Probably one of my favorite classes is advanced neuro. Um, it has both a didactic portion and a laboratory, like a skills portion. Some of the things we do in the class 
include treating patients here and also going to one of the hospitals, Orlando Health, to go treat patients there as well and receive some lectures from some of those clinicians. Hi there, I'm Jeff Schmidt. I'm a second year here in the physical therapy program. I'm also in room 231 where John had mentioned that we have a lot of our lecture courses. We also have a lot of lab courses here. We use these tables quite a lot in classes including cardiopulmonary, neurologic PT, geriatrics. We have numerous resources here in this classroom, including this ventilator and suctioning materials that you might use in the intensive care unit. What's interesting about our courses is that they're taught by specialists in these specific areas. Our cardiopulmonary class is taught by a professor that has been working in the ICU for tens of years now. Good morning, my name is Gabriela Armour and I'm a first year student here in the DPT program at UCF. We are in room 250 where we have our bigger classes that require hands-on labs. Yeah, as you can see, Jeff and John are in the background doing some joint mobilizations for the hips. We have adjunct professors join us for our lectures and labs to give their input for more class participation. Good morning, my name is James Maggart and I am a current second year here at UCF. We're still here in room 250 doing some more lab activities. Um, one of the main things that we hear a lot here at UCF when we go out into the clinic is that UCF produces some of the most prepared students during the first clinical and a big part of that is our integrations class. Uh, this is a class that happens near the end of the first year and we get to put together all of our didactic knowledge and lectures into one big patient care scenario. Uh, we transform the whole classroom into whatever setting we might be practicing in as you can see and we take the time to take everything we've learned in the program thus far, thus far and put it together and use it on simulated patients which are actually our classmates. Hello, my name is Kyle Abad. I'm a first year in the DPT program and we are in our PT anatomy lab. So in our first year, one of our core classes is anatomy, um, ana neuroanatomy one and two. Uh, the way that class looks like is we would come in on Wednesdays and talk about a certain structure of the body, for example, the upper extremity. Um, we would go into detail talking about the bones, the ligaments, the muscles that attach to the bones, as well as the neurovasculature. Um, on Thursdays, on the very next day, we would come into this anatomy lab and dissect those very structures in person to make it a more hands-on experience. So recently, we've had renovations done to the anatomy lab uh, that included the installation of these surgical lights, um, ventilation tables that take the fumes from the cadavers um, into the table and out of the building, as well as installation of these special cameras that we can use to broadcast images on a certain cadaver for the entire room to see, so we could display them on the monitors that you see. Um, one of the special things about our program is that the cadavers are PT, or PT exclusive, where we don't share the cadavers with the College of Medicine or the nursing program, and we also have 24-7 hour access to the, to the building. So you can come, come in after hours, study cadavers, or even use the other rooms that you saw, like 250 and 231, as study spaces uh, to practice with your classmates. Hi, my name is Akash Bali. Um, I'm in a second year in the UCF DPT program. I'm here to talk about our experience with the UCF Med School at Lake Nona. So recently we got the privilege of working with the medical school as teaching assistants. Why we do that is because we actually get two times more anatomy experience than the med students do. And what happened was we get selected, go to the med school and help teach the anatomy lab um, this is a very good interprofessional education event just because they get to see what we do and as well as us experiencing how they look at things from a different lens compared to us. It was a very good experience just because we got to learn various surgical techniques and radiological techniques that they do uh, versus how we look at things from a more musculoskeletal perspective. So our program offers a few off-campus labs for our use. One lab, the Innovative Mobility Initiative Lab, is run by Dr. Dawson and Dr. Tucker. There are a few projects that are run out of there, including the Go Baby Go and Grow and Play programs. Dr. Stock also runs another lab called the Applied Neuroplasticity Lab, which has numerous resources at hand for us to use, including strength and conditioning equipment, VO2 max with cycle ergometer, transcranial magnetic stimulation, isokinetic dynamometer, as well as ultrasound and EMG sensors. Great, 
All right. Let me make sure I can go. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, so that was just a brief overview of uh, some of the classroom spaces that we have. Uh, and just to give you sort of an, a brief overview of the rest of the campus, keeping in mind that UCF admissions does have uh, virtual tour options for the UCF campus right now. Um, so if you have any interest in, in doing that, definitely reach out to them. But some other highlights of the rest of the campus, there is the student union. So UCF has sort of a student hub called the student union that has free printing for students. SGA has ticket discounts to Orlando highlights like the theme parks, uh, museums, etc. And that's also where food is. So that's where a lot of different restaurants are as well. On campus, we also have the library. Uh, there are um, other options specifically for graduate students as well, like the Graduate Student Center that has uh, printing available as well as events specifically catered towards graduate students. Um, and then Dr. Pavian, are you still available to chat a little bit more about the uh, new clinical availabilities that we have on campus? Yeah, sure. Um... So there's a lot of, uh, you know, reorganization that's been going on with the university. Um, and we have now uh, become part of a school. Uh, so some of you from UCF may or may not have, have observed that, but we're now a part of the School of Kinesiology and Physical Therapy. Uh, and, and within that school, uh, we are now partnered uh, with, the, with the Division of Kinesiology uh, quite well. Um, so we are having a lot more interaction with their uh, graduate students, their PhD program, their master's program, and even some of their undergrads um, in some additional opportunities and, and even with research as well. Uh, but also in alignment with UCF developing an academic health science center, we have started developing some clinical practice initiatives that are going to, in, going to afford some opportunity for integration of our student population. Uh, I would say first, uh, the Division of Kinesiology uh, recently had started a sports science initiative, uh, which involves sports science consultation and research with UCF athletics. Uh, you know, in that kind of partnership, myself and some other faculty and students have been going over to UCF athletics and doing some screening activities with their athletes and in partnership with one of the uh, PhD faculty uh, from kinesiology. Uh, additional things that have kind of recently developed as well is that we also just uh, this last year developed a partnership with UCF Athletics in that we now employ the faculty member who is, who is performing uh, the physical therapy services for UCF athletes. So in that capacity, we're going to in the next, in this upcoming academic year and beyond, be able to have faculty and students integrated into the activities that are going on with UCF athletics in the treatment of those athletes and potential research uh, involving those athletes. Uh, so that's a really exciting initiative and that's, that's not common. Um, I think right now, uh, the only two universities that I can think of on the top of my head who are doing that are uh, Miami does that a little bit, but Duke does that uh, quite a bit as well. Uh, the next thing is that we also are developing a faculty practice. So starting this fall, we're going to be opening a PT practice inside student health services. Uh, that practice has been there for about five or six years, but it's now being transitioned into a complete academic uh, practice. So our, uh, we are going to be hiring a, a clinical practice faculty who will be uh, kind of leading the ship there um, so that's another thing that's going to be uh, very highly integrated into our program, in, in with our student needs, uh, and in with our faculty needs. So the clinical practice opportunities are going to tremendously expand on our own campus this year and beyond. So I wanted to make sure people were aware of that. Uh, so hot off the press. Uh, supposed to open in about a month. We'll see what COVID does to that opening. 
um, you know, in terms of how aggressively that moves forward, but it is going to move forward. So thanks. Okay. All right. So before we go into just more questions, I wanted to outline uh, some different resources. Um, so I saw a question about um, this being recorded. This is being recorded and I will be putting it on our YouTube channel. Uh, and then, like I mentioned previously, I will also be sending out this PowerPoint to everyone who's RSVP'd today as well. So um, you don't have to take any notes on this page at all. Uh, but keep in mind that our website is there for you whenever you might have questions. We make sure to have that chock full of information for you. Um, both Sam and I's contact information is at the bottom of this screen. Uh, so I'm Samantha Dot Fraley. If you have any questions about the application process as a prospective student, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Samantha Mundell, Sam, uh, has or sorry, um, advising appointments available for reapplicants. So if you are a reapplicant and you would like to discuss your previous applications and how best to improve your chances of getting into the program, um, she is there for you as well. On the right side, you see both the APTA and PTCAS websites. Um, the APTA website is great to learn more about the PT profession, the process of becoming a PT, uh, any other information revolving around um, the profession itself. The PTCAS application is, like I said, the giant hub for everything application. Uh, and that's also where you can get brief overviews of different programs and their requirements. We also have some of our social media there as well. So we are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as UCF uh, underscore DPT. I believe for all of them, our Instagram page might be UCF DPT, um, but there are links to all of those on our website as well. Uh, and then at this time, we're just here to take questions. So if you have any other questions for me, for Sam, for faculty, for Travis, uh, just plop those into the chat and we'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you have. All right, so. Um, so I see Alexandria's question about course retakes. So if you are retaking prerequisite courses, we do accept the highest grade available. So if you've taken biology, four different biology courses, uh, and all of them are, um, are able to be applied to the prerequisite courses, uh, then we will take the highest grade. If you are taking them in spring and you are applying that cycle, uh, we will allow up to one prerequisite course in progress that spring Keep in mind that those courses will not be applied to your prereq GPA because we won't get those grades in time. So uh, that's why we have that two in the fall, one in the spring rule. Um, those two fall classes we won't see until the, the academic update period and that one spring class we won't see until we already have offers out. Um, so that's one reason why it, it's very beneficial to have as many prerequisites completed prior to that November 1st deadline as possible. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to jump in real yeah. quick, Jax, because um, we didn't really touch on it, and we um, do usually during open house, but it's um, one of those things that we get asked on sometimes is uh, about out-of-state students yes. versus in-state students and, and the difference there, and are we looking at them differently? So. There's not a very uh, <laughs> neat answer to that. So we uh, do primarily look at in-state students uh, when considering uh, candidates for admission. And the reason for that is primarily because of intent to attend. Uh, the tuition cost difference between out-of-state and in-state is just really, really high. Um, so for in-state students, you can look at the rates online. We have them on our website and on the admissions page, but it's about sixty-five dollars to $66,000 for the three years for the entire program if you're an in-state student. If you're an out-of-state student, it goes up another about $100,000. So you're looking at 160 
thousand dollars um, as an out-of-state student and we have just found that that cost is just so prohibitive those out-of-state students typically don't come um, so that is why we primarily focus our um, attention on in-state students when we are looking at candidates that doesn't mean that we're not looking at out-of-state students at all we consider the top 10 percent of out-of-state candidates who apply but we just I just wanted to run through that real quick to give kind of a you know pull the curtain back a little bit about why we do that um, we do from time to time admit out-of-state students one or two maybe uh, every other cohort but primarily our um, cohorts are comprised of in-state students because of that you know hefty tuition cost so I just wanted to put that out there and make sure everyone understood and knew what your residency status was when you are going to apply. Every, every time we talk about this, I always have to put the disclaimer in there that I nor anyone with the, with the program make that tuition. I have tried to get that changed unsuccessfully. So if there are out-of-state students here, that is not our fault. We have tried and will continue to try because we don't feel that that's very just. So, disclaimer made. All right, I saw a question uh, about community service opportunities for students. Travis, do you want to chat a bit about uh, just what that looks like? What kind of opportunities you've been able to get involved in and your classmates as well? Sure. Um, uh, I guess I'll start by saying that uh, your first year here, you're very much sort of encouraged to observe what kinds of opportunities are available and which ones you might be interested in while making sure you focus on your grades um, and satisfying all, all of your coursework. Um, and then as you kind of get adjusted to everything, uh, there are opportunities that you can take part in. Um, my favorite one that I've uh, attended so far has been the Apopka Farm Workers Clinic. Um, is this massive interprofessional education opportunity that um, different uh, medical training programs throughout the university all participate in. Uh, there are medical students, um, pharmacy students, PT students, nursing students that all sort of set up this temporary clinic in Apopka to uh, help treat local farm workers who may not have insurance, who may be undocumented, who you know, may not have access to other forms of healthcare. And it's, uh, it's an amazing experience. Um, that's been my favorite so far. There are frequent calls for uh, students to volunteer and um, help with conferences that are going on here in the Orlando area. Um, I haven't gone to any of the Go Baby Go builds yet. Sorry, Dr. Tucker, uh, but I know that my classmates uh, really enjoy those as well. Um, so yeah, there's, there are lots of opportunities to get involved. You can kind of feel them out your first year, see what different people are advertising, what different people are looking for, um, and then sort of as you get your feet underneath you and you know that your grades are in good shape, then you can kind of go out and participate in those things. Awesome. Thank you, Travis. Uh, Dr. Dawson is going to be answering um, Andrew's question in the chat. Yeah, so I'm happy to, to kind of tackle that. I think, Andrew, I think it's a really great question. And this is one of the reasons, um, you know, that I, I think it's really important for you to get out and observe different settings, um, you know, for you to get your own feel about what our profession looks like to you. Um, quite honestly, looking back on my career, I've been a PT for about 19 years and I've, I've worked in multiple settings. Um, I've, I've done management. Um, I've now doing research and academics and I would tell you 100% unequivocal, I would not do it any differently. Um, I'm also one, I usually will tell you guys, it actually took me four times to get into PT school. Um, so I worked hard to get in. It took me, you know, I, I it, uh, long story, we could talk about that another time, or I'd be happy to answer questions if anybody has any in the chat about that whole saga. But anyways, it took me four times to get in. You know, I've been practicing for 19 years. I would not do it any differently. I do think that our profession is, is moving forward. Um, there is some conversations that I don't disagree with that I think sometimes we're trying to put the cart before the horse. Um, and trying to move ourselves a little more quickly than I think we should. 
um, based on kind of where we sit, but you know, that's with any profession. Um, there's so many great things about being a physical therapist. I think, you know, depending on what other career choices you're thinking of, you know, we really have the opportunity to make a true difference in our patients' lives every day. Um, you know, I get to do it through the students now um, and through my research. Um, and I still do treat, we still treat pro bono, um, you know, in the lab. Um, and so I still get to have this impact, whereas, you know, many other health professions don't really get to do the same thing. Um, and I think that the, the growing pains, um, if you will, that we're having in our profession are really transient. And I think, you know, hopefully we'll have good leadership uh, moving into our profession that will take us into the right place. Um, you know, because one of the things you see is, is right now, you know, we grew really fast. Um, you know, our professions only, we're going on our centennial, we're only about 100 years old. Uh, the DPT is new. So, you know, right now practicing out there are people who have bachelor's degrees still, people who have master's degrees, and then people who have doctorates, um, all in the same field, all practicing. And so that does create sometimes this dissonance, um, you know, with what we would consider evidence-based practice. But again, you know, my faculty, my, my fellow faculty and I will tell you that our job is to build the army to move us forward and make us better. And I do believe that our students, um, after they graduate, um, really do go out and make a difference and impact. Um, we get to spend, you know, an hour um, you know, to three hours a day with patients. And I don't know any other profession that gets to do that. And, um, you know, we really do have an impact in, in what they do. So, you know, despite some of those challenges that I do think there's some crappy PTs out there, I don't disagree with that, but I think you'll find that with any profession. You know, I think overall our, our profession is moving in the right direction. And some of these older PTs, you know, that don't like what's happening are getting pushed out and I'm okay with that. You know, because they're going to make room for Travis and his cohort mates and, you know, our graduates to go be awesome um, and, and really move our profession forward the way it should be. Um, because, like I said, I think being a PT, I, would, I wouldn't do anything differently. Um, and so I hope that that answers your question. And if you have any follow-ups to that, please, you know, throw it in the chat or unmute yourself and I'm happy to answer. Um, but I, I, our profession is amazing and, and I can't... I, I can't speak highly enough of it. And I think the things that you're hearing are growing pains of, like I said, this profession who is trying to figure out who we wanna be when we grow up. Um, and I think most of us are trying to move in the right direction. Um, and there's some stubborn people that we have to drag along with us. Um, and sometimes they're just a little louder, that's all. So hopefully that helped. All right, so we had a few questions about um, scholarships and tuition for the program. So Sam uh, did a brief overview of what that tuition looks like, specifically for in-state and out-of-state students. Um, any, any more details that you want about that uh, in terms of what that looks like year to year is available on our main website. Uh, and that, like Dr. Pavian mentioned, is all determined outside of us. We don't really have a say in what that looks like. Uh, and then in terms of scholarships, uh, so this is the not fun conversation that I get to have with applicants. Uh, because of the nature of our program, uh, we are a professional doctorate degree. We are not considered a research doctoral degree, even though we have that heavy research curriculum within our program. Uh, because of that, a lot of uh, fellowships and scholarships that are offered throughout the university are not available to our students because they are strictly for research students. Um, keeping that in mind, a lot of our students do apply for private scholarships. There is something called A2O, the letter A, the number two, and the letter O, uh, and that is essentially a search engine for scholarships. Uh, so we do highly recommend using that tool as well as any other scholarship searching um, that you're able to do on your own time. Uh, if we do hear of any scholarships available throughout the university, we do also send those on to our students. Uh, and then if there are any uh, availabilities for uh, assistantships, those are few and far between and generally they are given to students who are already in those positions. 
Um, so for example, if you were working with Dr. Tucker uh, and the Go Baby Go pr uh, process, um, if we have the availability to turn that into an assistantship, then we may be able to do that. So things like that are not a guarantee within our program. Um, and they do have to be fought for sometimes to get that funding. The majority of our students are paying for their tuition for the program in loans. Uh, so that's just the reality of the program itself um, and DPT programs in general. So do keep that in mind. Uh, we know that that's not an ideal process for anyone, um, but it is the reality. Uh, so just look into financial uh, situations within doctoral programs in general. We do try to make sure that our students are as uh, financially literate as possible. Sam actually has a finance literacy course that all of our first year students uh, attend that includes both past students as well as someone within um, the financial services office of our university. And that goes over um, loans, the process of loans, the process of paying off loans, um, as well as some tips and tricks that uh, alumni have used to, to really make that more of a, a realistic process for them. Um, Sam, do you have anything to add to that? No. Uh, no, sorry. Okay. I, have <laughs> no? To, I, have to, I have to close chat and then go to, yeah, no, I think you covered it. Yeah, that's okay. perfect. Perfect. <laughs> All right, um, let's see what other questions did we have in here. Uh, there was a question about the interview process and why we interview in groups versus doing yes. one on one. So um, we put a lot of work into our interview process. Uh, you'll actually find that a lot of programs have gone away from interviewing. I think about half of the interviews in the country no longer interview. So we're uh, one of the few that still actually want to talk to you in person and get to know you a little bit better. Um, small group interviews are for a couple of reasons. Um, we want to see how you interact with your peers. We want to see how you interact in, under stress. We want to see, you know, a lot of those things that you can't really get one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but do keep in mind that these interviews are 45 minutes times two. So you're interviewed twice by two different groups of interviewers um, for an hour and a half. So there's plenty of time to get to know you on a personal level. You are going to be asked unique questions. Um, there's you know, a really uh, a training that all of our interviewers go through before they can actually you know, come and talk with you. So we, we put a lot of thought into how we want to go about that process and we have found that the small group interview really gives us what we're looking for so i hope that answers that question yeah and i wanted to add to that sam uh that's a, that was a great response but i also wanted to say that we we are uh, we're vested and in, we're invested in the process um we want to make sure we we get you with as many faculty as possible um and we want to make sure that as many faculty as possible get to meet you as well um, and so, uh, again, it's a big commitment for you and for us. We want to be sure that you're going to be with us and succeed, and we want you to be in the best place as, as possible. You know, if you go and interview with just one faculty at one institution, then you might know one faculty at one institution, you know, but, but here you'll have met four, and you'll have met multiple students, and you'll have had time with students as well, so that you get the best feel for the culture of the, of the institution. You know, and I think that whole process is time consuming. It's difficult organizationally, um, as Sam knows. Um, and that's probably why many universities, number one, don't interview or when they do interview, um, they don't commit as much resources and energy into it. Um, and our, we want to make sure that our interview process is valid and it's meaningful, uh, both for you and for us. Well, yeah, and, and to add something too, like, you know, I, I just, you know, we were kind of um, chatting a little bit on the side with some of the faculty is, um, we also hope that you guys get to see, you know, the, the interview process is a resource intensive process, but us as faculty and staff, we are so dedicated to you guys that we make it work. I mean, 
look, we're on a virtual open house on a Saturday morning, right before finals week. And you have almost all the faculty have been here just to meet you guys and be available to you. And I can almost promise you that there is no other program in the country that anybody but Sam or Jax could make that happen. <laughs> like, you know, they say, we want you to meet these prospective students. And we're like, of course, um, we want to meet you too. And we want you to meet us. And, and I think Travis can attest to it is like, it's not fake. Like, cause if it was fake, we wouldn't be here. Like we would be, you know, out doing something different on a Saturday, um, you know, rather than sitting here and answering your questions. So, you know, what I hope that does is really show you how dedicated we are to you guys um, and, and we really want what's best for you. And we want to provide you as much information as we can to help you make the right decision for you. So I always, I, I, you know, I, I really did find that to be, you know, interesting and, and just really want you guys to, to really understand that, that that's how much we are invested in your success. And that, that, really reflects our, our faculty throughout the year too. Um, and I'm sure that Travis would agree that our faculty do really have that open door policy. They're there for students, whether it be to ask questions about exams or just complain about, you know, life <laughs> and stressors. And Sam and I have uh, chocolate in our offices. If students need a break, uh, that's our faculty are, are, are amazing. They're there for you guys, whether it be as a prospective student or a current student or alumni. Um, do we have any other questions? Chocolate does make everything better, Sam. <laughs> all right, well, it seems like we're winding down. Uh, so I want to first of all thank all of our faculty uh, and Travis for joining us and Sam. Um, it's, it's incredible to have you guys here to answer all of these questions. Uh, and then I want to thank all of you for coming and joining us today as well. Um, this has been recorded and I will be putting it on our YouTube channel. And then um, I will also be sending out that PowerPoint to everyone who's RSVP'd today. Um, so even if you know that a friend wasn't able to make it, if they, if they put their email in there, then they'll also get these uh, resources. And then if you have any questions moving forward. Um, if immediately after this you you leave and you're like, well, I forgot the biggest question that I wanted answered, just send it my way. Uh, you can email me at samantha.fraley at ucf.edu and that email is everywhere as well. Um, you can reach out to us over our social media channels. Um, I can answer you there and just keep in mind that we're here for you. And thank you guys so much for joining us today. All right. All right, so otherwise have a great Saturday and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye guys. <laughs>